Whilst you were reciting Ziyarat Ashura, you went into Sajda and you asked for the Shifa'at of Imam Hussein al-Islam on Yom al -Wurud, meaning on the Day of Judgment. Imam Jafar Sadiq al-Islam did something whilst he was in Sajda. <coughs> Imam Hussein al-Islam did something and this is in Al-Kafi. He says, Allahumma gfir li akhwani wa zwari kabri abi abdillah al Husayn. Whilst Imam Jafar Sadiq al-Islam was in Sajda, he says, O oh Allah, the words are very, very powerful. He said, O oh Allah, forgive my brothers. Imam is calling those brothers Zuwar Kabre Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Those Zuwars, those people who visit the Qabr of Imam Hussein al Islam. The word is not Mumineen, Ikhwani, my brothers. Imam Jafar Sadiq is calling those individuals who go to the Qabr of Imam Hussein al Islam. And this is for Yom al Qiyamah. Whoever goes to the Qabr of Imam Hussein al Islam, for Imam says, they are my brothers. This is a Masoom calling the Zawars his brother. This is no mean status. It is one of the greatest status that an Imam can give to his follower. Imam doesn't call everybody his brother. This is, if you read the history of the Masoomin, they do not call every Shia his brother. They call certain individuals their brothers. Those who are muttaqi and pious or are faqih. Mujtahids, they call them their brothers. But with regard to the Zawar, those who visit the Qabr of Imam Hussain Islam, the Imam is saying, Ikhwani, my brothers. And Al his Imam is praying in his sajda, may Allah forgive those. And the hadith goes on, it says, the money that they spent doing the Zawar, the money they spent, the change on their faces, the traveling and the pain and the suffering and the changes they have in their face may Allah lighten their face may Allah shine their faces today's topic is regarding Azadari Rashmi phoned me and said could you speak on Azadari I said yes I will speak on Azadari and one of the conditions I have is that time is something 
which always bound. When people say that you have an opportunity to speak, they give you a time limit. They say, well, you have 10, 15, 20 minutes. But things which need to be said are so powerful that it needs time for it to sink in. In order to understand Azadai, there's two aspects. And the way I give my lectures, I try to give a message within that lecture. It's no good you going happy with yourselves, and we heard a really fantastic majlis or a good lecture. No, I want you to go back with a message. And the message is this. In order to understand Azadari, you understand two aspects of Azadari. One is the status of Azadari, and the second is the purpose of Azadari. There's two different aspects here. You can understand the status of Azadari, and then perhaps you will not understand the purpose of Azadari. In rhetoric, when we talk on a higher level, we say, is something the end? Is something the end? Meaning, is Azadari the end? We do Azadari, but is that the end? Or is it a means to an end? Those of you who understand English, um, you will understand this technicality. Sometimes there is an end itself, and sometimes there's a means to an end. Azadari, I'm saying this with great responsibility, Azadari itself is a means to an end. So that means we have to find out what the end is. We do Azadari for a purpose then. It has a purpose. We've got to find out what the purpose is. So there's two aspects of understanding Azadari. One is the status of Azadari, and secondly, what is the purpose of Azadari? We can understand what Azadari is, we know what Azadari is, but let me just give you some understanding of Azadari. What is Azadari? First of all, this is a hadith from Rasulullah which says, Man baqa'ul Hussain. Man baqa'ul Hussain. Aw abqa. Aw tabqa. Tabaqa. Wajibat lahul jannah. Let me now just translate that, what that means. Man baqa'ul Hussain means whoever cries for Imam Hussain al-Islam. Aw abqa. Or who makes other people cry. Aw tabaqa. And this is so interesting. This final tabaqa. Tabaqa is that you're not crying. But you just make a face as though you're crying. Okay? So if I cry, or make you cry, or those amongst you who make a face as though or make a face as though you are crying, Rasulullah say, Wajabat Lahul Jannah. Upon him is incumbent Jannah. If you can just understand the profound, the deep meaning of this, if you make, if you cry yourself, if you make others cry, or even if you make a face as though you are crying, wajabat lahul jannah. Upon him is incumbent jannah. Is jannah so easy to gain, just to make people cry, and then to cry yourself, or make a face as though you are crying? This is the goal of a masoom. It is a masoom who is saying this. Rasulullah himself is saying this. Upon him is Jannah. And I'll talk about this in the purpose to understand what this really means. There's another hadith. This is again beautiful. It says, Inna li qatli li khusayn hararatun fi kulub al la tabrudu abada. It means that the martyrdom of Imam Hussein al-Islam it creates a heat, a warmth in your hearts. La tabrudu abada, which will never ever extinguish. So this is a mujza itself. Because Rasulullah is predicting that in every heart of a mu'min, there will be this heat which has been created after the martyrdom or even before the martyrdom, of Imam Hussein Islam, which will never subside. So in every moment, doesn't matter where you live in the world, 
whenever Muharram comes, whenever the name of Imam Hussein Islam is mentioned, you have this pain. And we all pray that may Allah increase this. We say love, but actually we're asking Allah, can Allah increase this pain that we have for Imam Hussein Islam? That is a prayer that you will not even ask for your dead father. Your dead father may have fought recently, but you will not say, Allah make me remember my father and make the pain that I had the day he died to exist in my heart. No. This is how humans act. When somebody dies, they forget him. But this dua of Rasulullah will remain forever. There's another very interesting hadith as well. It's mentioned in many books. The book we've read is Nafsul Mahmoom. And in this, on the 40 hadiths which he's mentioned, Allah's Kumi, Rahmatullah, he says that the Imam said that when you cry for Imam Hussain Islam, if one of those tears, one tear, one tear of the teardrop which comes from your eyes, if that teardrop is put into Jahannam, is put into Jahannam, and this is the call of Masul, that teardrop will extinguish the fire of hell. One teardrop, one teardrop, which comes in remembrance of Imam Hussain Islam, that teardrop will extinguish the fire of Jahannam, of hell. I'm not going to go into the dimensions of hell, how big hell is, or how hot hell is. The hadith continues, it says that it will extinguish the fire of hell as though the fire never existed in the first place. And this is so powerful. Usually, fires leave traces even when they've been extinguished. If a house burns down, you extinguish the fire, but you still see cinders. You still see the ashes of the fire. But this hadith is saying that the tear drop which is shed for Imam Hussein Islam will extinguish the hellfire as though that hellfire never existed. Now, let me just try to unwrap what a tear drop is. A tear drop is created through different forms. You can peel an onion and you can have ear drops. You can have somebody who dies and you are crying for him. That teardrop, which is created by an onion, that is a chemical reaction and it creates teardrops from your tear, tear ducts. But the chemical formulas, I've actually researched this, the chemical formula of a teardrop which has been created by this is called non emotional tear. A non-emotional tear is where the tear has come out because of a chemical reaction from the onion. But you can have a teardrop which also comes through happiness. People who are overjoyed, they also have tears. But they have difference. The chemicals are different in the teardrop. The teardrop which comes through emotions, through pain, has a different weight. So the teardrop itself is very, very light. One teardrop is very, very light. But because it is attached to something greater, and that is Imam Hussein al-Islam, that small teardrop is extinguishing the whole of Jahannam. Mashallah. And that is no big deal. It is because, and, and, and I said this, وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقُوا الْقُلُوبِ These things that we do, are actually something which is creating piety in us. Piety. Taqwa. Min taqwa al -kulub. All these things, Ash'ar al Husayni, these are all things which create piety. So regarding Azadari, Azadari is one of the greatest institutions in the world. Our Imams, they have promoted Azadari themselves. They told us how to do Azadari. So the Azadari that we see today is a legacy over history. It's not something that the Shias of Newport 
or the Shias of Husseini mission have created. This has a 14th century legacy. It's evolved over time, but the meaning is still the same. It stay, still has the same powerful meaning that Azadari is there to change people. My conversation with Ramshri often revolves around that we're trying to bring in the youth into our Husseinias. And we're trying to promote Azadari. And I've always supported him. I said, Azadari, it's a means to an end. You are at the stage of understanding what the means are. Azadari, when you start to understand Azadari, the importance of Azadari, then gradually over time, I'm not saying all of you, maybe some of you, know what the purpose of Azadari, Azadari is. And some of you, alhamdulillah, have become pious Mormons. And inshallah, all of you, inshallah, over the course of time will. Now let's just look at the purpose of Azadari. I said Azadari itself is a means to an end. So in order to understand the purpose of Azadari, there must be a bigger reason why we do Azadari then. So Azadari itself is not the entire end. It's a means to an end. So what is the bigger purpose? In order to understand this, I need to go into some aspects of history in order to understand why Azadari was such an important movement in history in order to change people. I'll ask for a few minutes on this and sometimes lecturers in Majlis often miss this because they don't have the time to. But because we're dealing with Azadari, I need to mention this. Both from my own research and also from researches which has been done by other people on a very academic level, they all decided, even Christians, Orientals have decided that in early Islam, early Islam, at the very beginning of Islam, they existed a concept, and this is very, very important to understand, there existed a concept that the rulers, the rulers, the very first rulers, the very first rulers, there existed a concept in early Islam which said that the rulers were also, I'll explain the word afterwards, the rulers were also the legislators. Um, now let me explain what I mean by this. In early Islam, whatever the Khalifa did, it was accepted as part of Islam. And this was the mindset of the early Muslims and the people who converted to Islam afterwards. That anybody who was a ruler of the Muslim Ummah was also <coughs> not the executive. The executive are the people who implement the laws. So you have the legislator and then you have the executive. These people were meant to be executive and not legislators. But what happened, these people, and I'll say this openly, that the first three Khalifas, they were not just Khalifas in the sense of them ruling the Muslim Ummah, they themselves considered themselves as the legislators. And this is why the second Khalifa, Umar ibn Khattab, he changed Islam so much, so much, that when Mullah Ali came to Kufa, when Mullah Ali, came to Kufa, he wanted to stop the Travi. He wanted to stop the Travi during Ramadan. Much like what he is the Khalifatul Muslimin, Mullah Ali, in Kufa. And he is trying to stop what? The Travi. He is a Khalifa himself. But because this had been going on for 25 years, the people said, no, we're not going to stop this. We have become used to Travi. Mullah Ali could not stop the people of Kufa from reciting Travi. Because why? They thought this is a part of Islam. And it wasn't. Mullah Ali could not stop this. So how could Mullah Ali stop so many other changes which had occurred in Islam? So Islam, the Islamic rulers, they became the legislators. The first, second and third were legislators. They changed Islam. 
then Muawiyah, he changed Islam. So this mindset existed from the very beginning, that whoever the Khalifa is, he is also a legislator, who whatever is implemented, you cannot change. This is why Yazid ibn Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan became such a dangerous personality in Islam. Because the Muslim mindset had already been formed and carved. And through this, and Yazid knew this as well, he knew that he had the ultimate power. If people did not accept willingly, he will make them accept by force. So Imam Hussein Islam, his qayyam, his rising up against Yazid was actually rising up against Muawiyah, against Usman, against Umar, and against Abu Bakr. This is the crunch. This is the crunch. This was the crunch. Imam Hussein Islam wasn't just rising up against Yazid. He was rising up against the whole system. The whole system which existed. So 50 years, 50 years from the death of Rasulullah up until time of the death of Muawiyah is only 50 years. And I often ask this question to some of the audiences. And the Sunnis also say that Yazid was changing Islam. He was doing so many bad things. He was playing with monkeys. He was such a bad man. My question is, if Muawiyah died on the 22nd of Rajab, on the 22nd of Rajab, on the 22nd of Rajab, Imam Hussein Islam leaves on the 28th of Rajab, six days after, did Imam Hussein Islam, we can say that he did, but did the general public know that Yazid were, was doing all these bad things within six days? The Sunnis, they cannot answer this question. It's, it's a complex question. How did the people know that Yazid was such a bad man in six days? Do you really want to know something about Yazid as well? Let me just tell you. Um, I wasn't going to talk about this, but this is important as well. Yazid himself, you will not have heard this. In order to understand what was going on in Damascus, Damascus city, the city of Muawiyah, I'm not going to go into great depth, which I can, because I've studied this in my own sort of um, uh, university work. I had access to a book, and in this book, uh, it's written by Ibn Usabiyah, and it talks about the time of Muawiyah. There, I don't know if anybody is a, a pharmacist here, but if you are a pharmacist, there is a, a tool that you use, it's a tube, which is for creating toxic chemicals, or it's a way of making chemicals, each chemical evaporates at a different temperature. And you can cool it at a certain place in that tube, and it becomes very, very powerful. We hear this all the time, that Imam Hassan was poisoned. Uh, we also hear that other people were poisoned during the time of Muawiyah. Maliki Ashtar was poisoned. These people were poisoned. And we also hear that Imam Ali's sword, <coughs> which was used to kill, hit Imam Ali, Abdurrahman ibn Mujam, this sword was also dipped in poison. The question is, where did this poison come from? All this poison. And this is not just mentioned in Islamic history. Both <coughs> European historians have mentioned this in their books. They have said that Muawiyah had an individual called Ibn Uthar. He was one of the most prolific toxicologists in the time of Muawiyah. And in this book, it said that Muawiyah would consult him Laylan wa Nahar, day and night. He would consult him. And he is the one who made the poison. And the interesting thing is that he was a Christian. He's a Christian. He is a Christian. Then there's another individual called Aqtal, Ghiyas al Aqtal. He was the poet, the official poet of Muawiyah. He was also a Christian. Then the chief treasurer of Muawiyah, his name is, and this is mentioned in history books, 
Sarjun. Sarjun, and he's also a part of the narrative, the story of Karbala, because he's the one who advised Yazid ibn Muawiyah. He was a Christian. And his son, his son, this Sarjun's son, has written a book in, Dam not just outside of Damascus, he, written a, he wrote a book against Islam, against Islam. His name is called John of Damascus, Yohanna Dimishki. He wrote a book against Islam. And in this book, he wrote that there was no revelation. He wrote in this book, there was no revelation. Rasulullah did all this just for enjoyment and just to gain power. He was also a Christian. You have all these people around Muawiyah who are Christian. Then you also have Yazid's mother, Maysoon. She is also, who? A Christian. There is nothing but Christianity in the courtyard of Muawiyah. Yazid, it says in one of the books, Yazid used to drink with this poet, al abdal and they used to have drinking parties with these Christians. And this was happening in Damascus in the courtyard of Muawiyah. He's seen these individuals, all Christians, drinking. And um, Yazid used to drink with his people. So this is the background of Yazid. And when the Kafla came to Karbala, from Karbala to Sham, Yazid had said to Sayyidah Zayn Islam al he said, there, there was no revelation. There was no revelation. You, Bani Hashim, did all this for power. And these very words still exist today in his book of John of Damascus. It's still available. It's written in, I think, Aramaic, the ancient language, but it's been translated. So let's now look at the purpose of Azadai. Imam Hussein al-Islam sacrificed everything for a cause. The cause was Islam itself. That people had to realize what Islam was. Everything could be sacrificed for Islam. Islam could not be sacrificed for anything else. So the cause that Imam Hussein was trying to promote is that you have to live, even as individuals, without looking towards the government for leadership, you have to look to yourself as individuals. And Azadari is something which should ignite, ignite something in your hearts. And you should be able to take something which Azadari is trying to give you. Azadari is giving you a message. And that message is that you have to become pious. You have to become muttaqi. You have to become, praise God. If you are not doing that, then Azadari is not really touching you. <coughs> Azadari is not touching you. If the martyr that you do, if you can raise the hand and bring it down to your chest and say, this hand is a change in me. And this hand is a change in me. And those of you who shed blood, who have shed blood, in this Muharram. If you can shed blood, you can sacrifice anything. If you can shed blood for Imam Hussein Islam, you have the power within you to do anything. There is no one thing which is stopping you because you have traveled along crying, Abqa, you have done the crying. You have done the matam. You have done the zanjirzani. That zanjirzani has to be translated into action. You have done the azar. Now reach out to what the message is. For what Imam Hussein al-Islam did was no mean feat. For he sacrificed Ali Askar. People sacrifice themselves, but they always try to protect their families. But Imam Hussein showed to the world 
for the oneness of Allah, for the deen of Rasulullah, the sanctity of the Kaaba, Imam Hussein protected, the sanctity of the Quran, Imam Hussein protected, the sanctity of Hajj, Imam Hussein protected, the oneness of Allah, Imam Hussein protected. But what did it cost? It was paid with the holy blood of Imam Hussein al-Islam and his family. For people try to protect their children, but Imam Hussein al-Islam even sacrificed his Ali Askar, a six-month-old child, for the cause of Allah. On the one hand, you've got 124,000 prophets, and on the one hand, you have Ali Askar, who is protecting the very thing that these 124,000 Anbiya and Prophets came to protect, and that was Tawheed. A child, a child. Imam Hussain is giving this child, that this child is also the protector of Tawheed. I think I've gone over my time.